scattering, but also beyond. And we have three talks, each of which are to last 20 minutes and for with 10 minutes for questions. So our first speaker is Timothy Hobbs. Uh, please go ahead. Yes, and uh, thank you very much, Felina. Is my screen coming through and can you see the cursor? Uh, can you move the cursor? Yep, it works. Very good, very good. Okay, thank you, Helena, so much for that, that introduction. So I'm really thrilled to be here um, this morning or afternoon to discuss with you a topic that excites me, um, and that's really the future of this field, and in particular, what the next generation of deeply inelastic scattering facilities, namely the EIC and the LHEC, may have to say about activities at the Large Hadron Collider. Let me quickly disclaim before I launch into things in greater detail that this is, of course, a very broad subject um, that encompasses many different issues. And in a talk of this length, um, necessarily, I cannot get to all of them. So I therefore refer those interested to the recent community documents on behalf of each facility, the EIC Yellow Report, as well as the recently updated LHEC white paper um, for, for a much more thorough discussion. So where to begin in discussing the future, if not, of course, the present, we heard a good deal of this already today um, in the, the uh, several very excellent talks just now. But of course, the current status at the LHC is that a huge amount of data has already been logged, um, something approaching um, 140 inverse femtobarns. And aside from some tantalizing hints that we've heard about in the last several weeks um, from LHCB and Fermilab's muon G-2, um, up to this point, the standard model has been really substantially confirmed again and again, in the sense that standard model predictions um, across an array of various channels and processes have been very, very successful in predicting the outcomes of experiments at, um, at the LHC. And that's with current statistics. And as we've just been hearing, of course, the expectation um, is that the end of um, the second long shutdown is coming to a close. And going towards, say, 2030, there will be a spectacular takeoff in the accumulated, uh, the accumulated statistics approaching something like um, an inverse auto barn um, going toward 2030. So that's very, very exciting, of course. And the expectation is that that new data will help us really begin to beat down the statistical uncertainty in many of these determinations. But what that, of course, also means is that the systematics limitations will become ever more of an issue going forward. What that means for the sake of this talk, of course, is that if we wish to improve the discovery potential, um, say, for BSM physics, at the HLLHC, we necessarily have to begin dealing with these issues. And what that means here is really dealing with things like PDF, electroweak, nuclear, theoretical, or other uncertainties that are very often a systematics limitation. And it's really in this context that I emphasize that I believe the future DIS facilities will be very, very instrumental um, in, as part of this program uh, within our field. And as really a vehicle for making this point, I'll use other things as well, but primarily I'll use the PDFs, of course. Why the PDFs? Why do we care so much about this? Why are we always talking about it? It's, of course, because the PDFs are really the essential, at least non-perturbative ingredient into theoretical calculations at the LHC. Empowered, of course, by the technology of QCD factorization, we can write down in general typical LHC cross-sections, say, as something like a convolution of something we know from perturbation theory with them, the PDFs, um, these, these objects that I'm attempting to highlight. And for that reason, uh, my colleagues and I, and those of us who work in this field, sort of the theory and phenomenology of uh, PDF determinations, have worked very hard to push the sum of the theoretical accuracy and the precision of the PDF fits themselves. So the contemporary standard at this point is now, of course, next to next to leading order in, in QCD for the extractions of the PDFs. And we're always working to improve things. Um, and an, an ongoing effort, for instance, that I would draw your attention to is um, types of benchmarking exercises. And I refer to you, my, uh, refer you to my colleague Thomas Cridge's talk on the PDF or LHC benchmarking exercises that we're engaged in. The point, however, is that the LHC program uh, really requires high precision in this area. And, and what that means, of course, is just reducing the PDF uncertainties that are illustrated on this slide. 
And that's absolutely critical to going towards um, next to next to leading order theory accuracy and proofs, as well as N3LO. And also this is um, absolutely essential for keeping pace with improvements in Monte Carlo technology, such as we heard on Monday from Stefan Heuke. So this is absolutely essential. Now, just a quick illustration of how this sort of works in general. I already mentioned this briefly, but many of the, the kinds of HEP quantities, if I can put it that way, that we really care about are indeed PDF limited. So I'll be talking about several of these, of course, the Higgs cross-section, but things in the electroweak sector as well. And the way this works is the following, I and mean, this is a somewhat outdated table, but if you wish to extract things like the W mass or say um, charge splittings in the W mass, in general, there's an array of contributions to the extraction, um, an array of um, contributions to the uncertainty in the extraction, but you notice the size of the PDF uncertainty. It's very, very large. And in fact, in this instance is, is really a dominant uncertainty. We can try to beat down the statistical uncertainty and that will certainly happen, but the PDF uncertainty remains a very critical limitation. And so the message here is if you wish to go toward sort of sub percent precision at the LHC or the HL LHC, you have to somehow grapple with this. And this is where uh, the remainder of this talk will really come in. The idea being that um, precision DIS data can be very helpful to this, to this end. And the reason is several fold. Of course, DIS affords us access to information on the quark currents inside um, scattered hadrons and the proton in this case, it tells us about scaling violations in QCD and the gluonic content. And it can be very useful for negotiating, if you'd like, among tensions in the fitted legacy data that we have at present and can be potentially independent of nuclear effects. I'll go into these issues in a little bit more detail. Now, just to remind everyone, there's a certain amount of preaching to the choir in this case, but DIS is, of course, really, if you'd like, um, empirically a kind of gold standard for getting at this information. I just mentioned this, but the idea, of course, is that um, DIS, certainly in the inclusive case, is a, is a very clean way of accessing um, the internal structure and dynamics of hadrons through electroweak probes. And the idea, of course, is that one can perform um, DIS measurements over a, a very large range of, um, of Bjork and X and a very large range of scales. And this essentially furnishes a kind of kinematical lever arm that one can use to, for instance, unfold the gluon content. And the idea, of course, is that the extractions of this type in general rely on um, factorization theorems in QCD that are, are quite well under control in general. And the perturbative sector is known um, to very good accuracy now, thanks to the efforts of theorists um, up to N3LO in principle. And so the idea for this talk, of course, is that there'll be a, a potentially an array of future experiments that will reprise measurements of this type and extend them into new territory and really provide valuable sort of information as a lever arm over both the PQCD and the PDF extractions. So there'll be two, two components to this talk, focusing on the EIC as well as um, opportunities at the LHC and DIS mode, so the LHEC and potential FCC and, and EH mode. That'll be this talk. I wish to, again, just very quickly disclaim that's not the full story, of course. There are neutrino programs in the US and Japan. There's ongoing JLab 12, which will continue into the future. And there are things like EIC China, which I simply can't go into detail in this talk. But for the sake of this presentation, the DIS programs of the future, as I've already mentioned, are really um, the EIC and the LHEC canonically, which um, in many ways pursue complementary physics programs as can be seen by essentially the, the planned coverage that these measurements would have in the XQ squared plane as depicted in the bottom left panel here, for instance. So in particular, this sort of green trapezoid represents the potential coverage of the electron ion collider, whereas this bluish trapezoid is um, the LHEC, which could be extended at the future circular collider in HE mode. And the idea, of course, is that with the LHEC, owing to its very high energies, one has the potential to push to very low X with broad coverage to extremely high uh, energy scales um, up to the level of the LHC data. This would give us coverage over low X and um, allow us to do um, very, very precise perturbative measurements as well. The EIC um, can do similar sorts of things in principle, but is primarily targeted a little bit more towards sort of the high X and um, lower momentum type scales with a particular sort of physics motivation or focus on, on attempting to really unravel, if you'd like, this quark to hadron transition region. 
Um, there are potentials for LHEC to, again, sort of provide cross checks to the EIC program, and there are regions of kinematical overlap between them, which is actually a very much um, something of value. But the point that I would really like to stress again and again in this talk is, is really the, the extremely crucial complementarity between these two programs that would really, if both are realized, would really, I think, give us unprecedented access to um, both um, precision QCD and um, standard model theory, as well as PDF extractions. Now, for those who somehow have not been so much paying attention to this field for the last several years, I want to note, of course, quickly that there have been um, tremendous developments in the electron ion collider of the last year plus. Many of you surely know that, of course, in January of last year, the USDOE um, moved forward with CD0 in this program and um, site selection for Brookhaven National Lab. I look forward to Tim Hallman's talk, where he'll, uh, I think, tell us a good, a good deal more about this. But the point is that the EIC is really sort of the dedicated machine um, for QCD in the US going forward in the sense that it would investigate both perturbative and non-perturbative QCD and aim at something like a multi-dimensional unfolding of the structure of nucleons, other hadrons, and of nuclei as well. Um, Barbara Pasquini told us um, in great detail some of how this might work in principle. And to this end, over the last year, many of us have been engaged in a yellow report exercise to really build the physics case further for this machine and invest more in uh, the detector design. And so many of the conclusions that I'll be showing you are, are sort of drawn from this effort. So again, roughly speaking, what is the EIC in just a few words? It's something like a very high luminosity incarnation or perhaps reincarnation of Hera, extending the Hera luminosity by two to three orders of magnitude with a fairly broad range in collision energies that are um, potentially possible at this facility going from 20 to 140 GeV. Um, this would be realized by adding an electron source on top of the existing relativistic heavy ion collision um, collider uh, facility at Brookhaven with a number of very exciting options. We would have at our disposal um, collisions with electrons and potentially pol uh, and polarized or unpolarized protons and potentially positrons as well. Um, as well as polarized and unpolarized light nuclei like uh, deuterium or helium-3. And then also there's um, a helicity dependent electron or potentially positron collisions with um, unpolarized heavy nuclei all the way up to uranium, which would also be very um, exciting and helpful. So the idea here with the EIC is of course with um, this tremendous precision available to us as I just discussed, one can begin to uh, really start improving things at the level of the PDF uncertainties. And so here I just lift an example from the work we produced in the yellow report just very recently. And the idea is that with something like a year of peak running, um, a mere year of peak running at the EIC, one can really start to um, push down the um, PDF uncertainties, especially at high X, for instance, for things like valence quark distributions, but, but in other places as well. And this was estimated in an array of different frameworks. Um, and I refer you to my colleague, Filippo De Caro's talk. He talked about this a little bit more. This is at the level of just um, inclusive reduced cross sections. I'll stress and develop in a few minutes um, the fact that one would also have um, various kinds of other channels at the EIC, um, final state tagging, the possibility of positron beams that I just mentioned, which would also afford greater precision. I want to quickly note, um, elaborating on this point, that um, again, the PDF impacts at the EIC could be very, very substantial. This is something that we investigated in the context of our own CTEC T group, for instance. And the idea is that one can, in a, in a way, sort of score the EIC pseudodata, again, from an approximate um, presumed year of running, against the very, very high impact aggregated collection of um, legacy fixed target DIS data that is very influential in the global fits. And the idea here, just by comparing, comparing the various bands shown, is that, in fact, um, just this single year of EIC running could in fact really surpass all of the fixed target legacy data, uh, many, many, something like a thousand data points that we already fit, and would thereby be very useful for negotiating um, what we, you know, negotiating the polls among the various data sets at this level in the global analysis. So this is really an, an essential point. I want to quickly note um, that, that again, 
I mean, a chief focus of the EIC program is really targeting non-perturbative physics. And again, that's very essential for PDF determination. So it's not just about measuring inclusive quantities like reduced cross-sections, but really getting at multi-dimensional type measurements. And so I just quickly note that um, unraveling higher twist effects, looking at various forms of power suppressed dynamics that are relevant at lower W to high precision are very much in play getting at multi-dimensional types of distributions like GPDs from deeply virtual Compton scattering, um, getting at TMDs as well from semi-inclusive DIS. These are all very critical aspects of the program that in principle might let us do very exciting things like unfold, for instance, the high X behavior of anti-quark distributions, um, which remain um, rather poorly constrained. I would note that this is actually an exciting opportunity in the context of other recent experiments like Sequest that were very recently released and uh, discussed at this meeting. Um, and I, for those who are interested, I would just note that um, preliminary results from the CT group are already available um, at this link. But in general, the point is that we can describe them really quite well already. Now, I mentioned the PDF impacts of the EIC program. I wish to also comment um, that with this very large precision, one can do various other intriguing things. Um, one can, for instance, extract um, alpha strong to very good precision in principle and make quite substantial progress, reducing the uncertainty in alpha strong by something like 40%, again, with just a small subset of, of presumed data. Similar arguments go through for the heavy quark masses as well. Um, and the idea is, of course, one can do other things. It's not, again, just about the inclusive data. There are various other things that are available um, at the EIC, for instance, global event shapes that might allow um, very precise extractions of alpha S based on n jettiness, for instance. Um, other couplings are also accessible, for instance. We'll see you down to five minutes. OK, thank you very much. One can also, in principle, um, have very substantial sensitivity to things like sine squared theta w. Um, this goes through the PDF um, improvements go through as well to the Higgs cross section. Of course, this is just the standard model um, PDF based prediction for the Higgs cross section where improvements, for instance, to the gluon um, densities from the EIC data can really drive our knowledge of the Higgs cross section and potentially once fitted in a global analysis can improve the theoretical prediction for things like the total cross sections. And that also applies to the TT bar as well. And again, we can improve um, on things by leveraging potential positron data. Um, let me just quickly note that we have, um, as I was just saying a moment ago at our disposal, um, a number of different avenues to get at um, exciting opportunities in PDFs and in um, um, standard model parameters. Um, we can do this, for instance, through jet production or heavy flavor production. So at the EIC, one might do, for instance, um, a charge current DIS jet production, which might allow us to, for instance, tag on a final state produced charm and at the event level be already quite sensitive to different scenarios for the behavior of the non-perturbative strangeness in the nucleon. Um, it's not all about PDS, of course. You can do various other jet-based studies. And I refer you to my colleague, um, Miguel Iratia and Michael Clausen's talks about um, possibilities at the EIC and, for instance, diffractive dijet production and tests of factorization that come there from. I want to just quickly mention, my time is fleeting, but um, there are also opportunities at the EIC in the electroweak and BSM sector, where, in principle, parity violating electron scattering can be used to get at um, sine squared theta w to quite good precision. One can also do things like e to tau as well and try to, in principle, uh, place novel limits on leptoquark scenarios, which um, this is something that was discussed as well in the yellow report. So with that, I come to um, the second phase of my talk where I'll go through some of the same kinds of arguments at the LHC with the LHEC, which in this case would um, see the augmentation of the LHC with the inclusion of an energy recovery LINAC, which would in this case supply an energetic electron beam to the LHC facility and allow collision energies um, for the first time really in DIS at the TEV scale up to, up to 1.3 TeV, again with extremely high luminosity as can be seen. And what this does is this opens up very, very compelling opportunities to test um, and probe QCD as well as the standard model. Now, very much as I had said for the EIC, one can do exciting things at the LHC also um, at the level of the PDFs. 
For instance, fitting um, uh, um, um, something approaching an inverse auto barn of potential LHEC pseudo data in, say, the XFitter package, one can get really striking improvements in the PDF uncertainty, for instance, for the gluon, including at very, very low X, down to 10 to the minus 6, for instance, at the LHEC, which, um, again, opens up exciting possibilities for studying saturation, the onset of BFKL scattering. I refer you to Anastasto's talk. And then regarding the PDFs again, one can also do exciting things at high X for, for instance, devalence. And I refer those interested to my colleague Claire Gwenlin's talk. Um, and again, this is absolutely critical for BSM searches um, where signals of BSM um, physics could potentially appear in sort of tails of rapidity distributions or in um, high mass Drellian spectra, where again, sort of the high X PDFs are also very critical. Um, the PDS, again, this message goes through now, of course, to things like um, um, alpha strong determinations at NNLO and beyond. Again, due to this powerful sort of kinematical lever arm at the LHEC, one in principle has the opportunity to achieve really unprecedented precision in determinations of alpha sub s at the sub percent level or strongly sub percent level down to 0.1%, something like this. So this is very, very critical to going to N3LO, of course. At N3LO, one can also um, make great strides in um, predictions for Higgs total cross sections, as can be seen in this right panel. So very, very exciting opportunities there. It's not only about um, total cross sections. Again, due to the fact that you're really at the TEV scale, you can um, now produce directly the Higgs um, boson and analyze various decay channels at the LHEC, which presents very fertile ground for testing the standard model in the Higgs sector. And um, one can, of course, do this in sorts of electroweak processes of this type. And in principle, actually really begin to beat down PDF uncertainties or other uncertainties um, in the decays to specific, to specific channels in Higgs production and really begin to constrain Higgs couplings to an unprecedented level. This goes through again um, to the TT bar sector as well, as well as alpha strong, as I just mentioned. I'm rapidly approaching the end. But let me just say that um, it's not all just alpha strong or Higgs, of course. Um, there are opportunities in the electroweak sector also. So um, with um, LHEC data, we could really begin to understand or constrain the mass of the W boson to an unprecedented level um, below, in principle, 2 MeV. I referred you to Ludovico Periobella and Daniel Britzker's talks um, for more details on this point. And the idea here is that one could, in principle, really relieve um, the PDF uncertainty in um, um, the W mass determination by greater than a factor of two. Um, and this, would, of course, is something that one would extract through for a low pile up data in, in MT and PT channels at the HLLHC. So this is something where you would really run in parallel this LHEC and, and begin to really unfold MW to high precision. Um, sorry. And, and so um, in terms of electroweak couplings, the message is, is very much the same. Extremely high precision is in, in principle realizable here in, at an unprecedented level. Um, and again, I'll just uh, very quickly uh, note in the interest of time that, um, of course, effective, um, effective interactions can be probed. And then in so doing, one can also begin to constrain um, essentially the kinds of um, anomalous types of form factors that would encode uh, non-standard model interactions, so in place limits um, in, in a very strong fashion on, on BSM couplings. So um, before I get to my conclusion, one more quick uh, comment that I wish to note. Um, I, I mentioned it at the start, but very frequently a critical issue is um, the subject of, if you'd like, nuclear ambiguities in trying to um, push precision in, for instance, the electroweak sector at, at, LH, at LHC. Um, to give a particular example, um, for instance, we find that um, some of the most incisive data in our knowledge of um, sine squared theta W extractions from um, forward backward asymmetries at the LHC actually come from experiments involving deuterium, DIS experiments involving deuterium. So it's really critical that we begin to understand the deuteron structure in, in better detail. Alternatively, of course, as I've just been saying, um, experiments like uh, the EIC or the LHEC could really start to understand the hadronic structure in an even cleaner fashion and avoid some of these nuclear corrections. 
But the other side of that double-edged sword is we would have nuclear targets at our disposal and we could actually explore the nuclear medium in much greater detail as well, beating down um, 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 NPDF uncertainties and as well as doing other things. And there have been many presentations at this, this meeting that I just unfortunately cannot go into detail. Both the EIC and the LHC present exciting opportunities in, in nuclear jet production and hadronization, various other things that have quite important implications for um, AA scattering as well as ultra peripheral collisions at the LHC. So this is an exciting thing. So um, before getting to the conclusion, I just wanna quickly note that um, building this connection is really a community exercise and a great deal has already been going on in this direction for SNOMAS 2021, for instance. Um, I just want to note that there um, are arrays of um, letters of interest that have been input into the SNOMAS um, effort, both on the EIC side as well as on the LHE side, LHEC side. And um, these sort of colorful objects are in fact links to these things that, that I encourage you to investigate. And the point is that I think we really have to begin um, digging into the connections between these kinds of futuristic DIS programs and opportunities at the LHC to, to really build the physics um, case to, and, and the sort of the analysis tools to, to do this. So with that, I come to my conclusion. I hope I haven't gone too long. Um, I, I uh, have really quite a simple conclusion at this level. It's simply that the future of this field, I think, is about as exciting as at any time in the past. We stand in the completion of the HERA program. JLab 12 will continue to run into the near term. And going beyond, we look forward to the start of the EIC program and potentially um, LHEC beyond. These will be absolutely critical to realizing the precision goals at the HLLHC. And we have to do more as a community, I think, to, to, to prepare for this. So with that, I conclude. I thank the many colleagues who've made essential contributions to this work and I invite um, any questions or comments. So thank you very much. Thank you, Timothy. There is still a little bit of time left for very urgent questions. I don't see any hands raised. Abe, do you see? No, I don't. Okay, fine. So uh, then, uh, thank you very much, Timothy, for this very uh, quick and uh, interesting uh, look into the future. And uh, we will move on then to okay, the thank next talk. Thank you. We'll move on on the next talk by Joachim Memich on the European strategy for Arctic physics. Joachim? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Okay. Um, you should share your... Uh, I'm doing, and you should see my slides in full screen. Perfect. Now, and if you give me a few more microseconds, uh, or can start the talk. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. You. Uh, uh, I was um, uh, for the opportunity to introduce to you the update of the European strategy for particle physics, uh, which was uh, um, uh, finished uh, last year in summer of last year and developed under the uh, leadership of uh, my chairperson, Halina, here. And I'm uh, uh, glad to be here with you. So first, let me uh, tell you a little bit about the strategy process, which was a, a process spanning over several years. You see here a timeline actually uh, starting back in 27 when, when council uh, first uh, called for an update of the strategy until June of last year, when a certain council finally updated uh, the strategy. There were certain uh, key milestones, I think, uh, which you find here on the right hand side. The open symposium for the community, which took place in Granada in May 2019. And then the strategy group, uh, a bunch of uh, some 60 people or so, which you see there, which drafted the strategy document, which then, as I said, finally was uh, approved. This is it. Uh, uh, as you can see, it contains actually 20 statements on various things, major developments, general considerations, high priority future pro projects, uh, essential activities for particle physics, organi organizational issues, 
and also uh, impact of particle physics on society and environment. I will not uh, go through all the statements here one by one, as you can uh, imagine. I will focus on a few selected of them and in particular uh, try to uh, tell you something about the developments here at CERN and elsewhere since uh, June of last year. So let me start with the first, and I think this was also uh, clearly expressed in the strategy document as the priority for the LHC, including the high luminosity upgrade of the machine and detectors, which should remain the focal point of uh, European particle physics. So here you see uh, the uh, schedule of uh, the LHC for about uh, 20 years. Uh, so we are now uh, somewhere here in April 21, and that what is called the long, uh, the long shutdown two, which sees um, major upgrades of the detectors, Alice and LHCB, but also for Atlas and uh, CMS, with the goal to be able to restart then in, uh, in February uh, next year uh, with the, the so-called run three, which then will last for three more years. I'll come back to this in a, in a minute. Um, there is a bit on the long range plan, the phase two upgrades, which is uh, also something which is going on now beyond the R&D phase pre-production for in particular Atlas and uh, CMN as, and then of course the high luminosity phase of the LHC, which is supposed to start with it. There are already uh, plans for further upgrades, uh, in particular of Alice and LHCB, which are, are supposed to be realized then in the early uh, years of the next uh, decade. The final goal of the LHC is then to accumulate something between three and 4,000 in this femtobahn. Now, let me come a bit more to the uh, current ongoing uh, activities, the uh, so-called long, long shutdown two, in which we are at the moment and the preparation for the run, uh, which is then supposed to start uh, early next year, with actually a pilot run foreseen for the machine uh, end of September, beginning of October. And I think which is, and I'll come back to this in a minute, a training campaign for the dipoles, which has already started to reach then the ultimate uh, 14 TeV uh, center of mass energy of the LHC. So the run three, which is supposed to start next year, is expected to provide uh, some luminosity of above 160 in those femtobahn per experiment. Or in other words, we hope to be able to double the data set, uh, the combined data set of run one and two for Atlas and CMS. And you see here some prediction. This is a very detailed uh, schedule of the machine uh, where we are now. You see here we are in April and you can see a few uh, of the eight sectors of the LHC, which uh, in the so-called training campaign uh, trying to push up the energy, uh, to, to push up the magnetic field to reach the ultimate energy of uh, the machine. Now, status of the, uh, the LHC, uh, one major activity was to uh, the so-called LHC injector upgrade, which uh, had, has as goal to increase the beam intensity and brightness to meet then the uh, high Lumi LHC demands. This work has actually successfully completed already by the end of, of last year. We hope that we'll be able to reestablish uh, this year and the work has started to the, the situation where we were before the long shutdown through two and then ramp up to the full uh, specs which then uh, are required for the high luminosity phase. Now the dipole training campaign I mentioned already, the goal is to re-establish the B field which is required for the 7 TV proton beam energy. Actually, I remark here that all dipoles which are down in the tunnel have attained this B field already before installation, but uh, for some reasons they forgot about that. And you see here the ongoing uh, campaign already uh, trying to push up sector by sector the energy 
uh, the, the, the B field to the 7TV equivalent here. And you see here two sectors and the quenches. Now, this is a major exercise. Uh, the expert estimate there's in total something like 600 dipole uh, quenches are needed uh, for the final uh, goal here. OK, a bit on the status of the experiments. Uh, the uh, upgrades of the experiments are really impacted by the pandemic, the closures of universities, laboratories, travel restriction, et cetera, uh, PP. And uh, the experiments are really struggling with that. But I want to uh, also convey the message that there is a lot of progress and the experiments are working very hard to keep the schedule. Here you see an example of the new small wheel uh, from Atlas, the first of the two wheels, which you see is looks like almost completed. Uh, Alice in a tracking system has recently been installed uh, in the experiment, which you see on the left-hand side here. And this is the situation in CMS with the central beam pipe back in place uh, already. Now, let me uh, move uh, on to the high priority future initiatives. And the strategies clearly says that an electron positron Higgs factory is supposed to be the highest priority next collider. And at the same time, on the longer term, the European particle physics community has the ambition to operate a proton proton collider at the highest possible uh, energy. Now, this has uh, the, the let me uh, start with this by reminding you that the uh, previous strategy update in 2013 uh, initiated a study for a future circular collider or FCC for short, uh, which was launched. And the first phase of this FCC design study was completed in 2019. And the result of this uh, uh, so called uh, uh, CDR. Uh, uh, the, uh, was uh, published, uh, which is here, which contains baseline machine designs, performance matching, and so on. And this was also an input then uh, for the discussion to the uh, uh, last update of the um, of the um, strategy. So. As a consequence of this statement in the 2020 strategy, CERN is now launching a so-called FCC feasibility study, which includes both the FCC as the first option, uh, the electron uh, FCC EE as the first option for the FCC, and then on the longer term, the Hadron uh, machine. So uh, the electron positron Higgs and electroweak factory as a possible first uh, stage. The idea is that this feasibility study is completed by the next strategy update, which we expect to take place in the second half of this uh, of this uh, decade. And uh, at the end, it should uh, be the basis for possible project decision. Um, commenting on the on the 100 kilometer tunnel geological aspects and optimization host state related processes colliders and, and injectors and uh, in particular also high field magnets as you can see now leaving the fcc uh mentioning also alternatives for a plus and minus higgs factory the european strategy also made i think a strong statement on the uh ILC project in Japan that would be compatible with the strategy and mentions that the European particle physics community would, in case it's realized in a timely fashion, uh, would wish to uh, collaborate. On, uh, uh, on the ILC in 2020, the uh, International Committee for Future Accelerator, ICFA for short, set up the so-called uh, ILC International Development team which is supposed to prepare a pre-lab in Japan with the chair of Tatsuya Nakada and uh, participation from all regions. I give you here for your uh, leisure the composition of the, the say management of this IDT. I note at this uh, occasion also that a click at CERN is still retained as a possible future option for CERN even though the uh, uh, R&D for CLIC 
will be reduced uh, to the benefit of FCC over the next years. Uh, this is uh, to remind you a bit uh, more information on the ILC, the 250 uh, GEV center of mass energy option, which serves as a Higgs factory or could serve as a Higgs factory. Now, moving on in the important issues identified in the strategy, uh, of course, accelerator and detector R&D belongs to that. In particular, accelerator uh, R&D uh, has been uh, identified as a key element for all future possible collider or non-collider project. High field magnets, I think, is a key development for the FCC hadron options, as you know. High gradient accelerator structures, both plasma wake field and superconducting RF, a muon collider, and uh, also an energy recovery uh, LINAC belongs uh, to, uh, to this. I'll come back to this in a minute. Likewise, uh, detector R&D is uh, considered to be uh, very important for the future and um, international collaborations beyond Europe are highly encouraged. And as one example, particularly interesting for this community perhaps, is that CERN is at the moment discussing collaboration with the uh, EIC on accelerators, in particular the, the, the synergy between FCC, electron, positron option, and also detectors. I mentioned the long range uh, plans for ELIS for the long shutdown. Yeah. Let me start with the accelerator roadmap. So as a consequence of the European strategy, um, uh, the, the national laboratories together with CERN are charged by council to define a roadmap for accelerators covering exactly the, exactly the, the, the topics which I just mentioned, including also education and training for the future generation of accelerator uh, scientists. Here you see a few names, uh, important uh, people who are leading this, uh, uh, this um, uh, roadmap development, which then through the group of the large uh, laboratories in Europe are supposed to report to CERN Council. And the goal, to my understanding at least, is that by the, up, by the next update of the strategy, viable options uh, which uh, deserve to be pursued uh, can be identified uh, at that point as a result of this work of the roadmap. ECFA, this, which is the European Committee for Future Accelerator, has been charged to define a detector R&D uh, roadmap for the future. And here you see uh, the organization of the structure which has been uh, set up Again, there are um, um, key people like Phil Alport, who is chairing this. And you see here the various detector uh, technologies which have been identified to uh, be uh, part of this uh, roadmap panel uh, development. Uh, another thing that uh, ECFA has initiated is a study on physics and experiments uh, towards a Higgs factory with the goal to bring the entire plus and minus uh, effort together. So the circular and the, the linear option and to foster the collaboration across the various uh, project. The goal here is that it should lead to something like an ECFA report, a yellow report at CERN uh, like uh, the uh, LHC was done many years ago and the phase two for the LHC detectors also some years ago. And also here, uh, an international advisory committee has been set up to define the work program and the conveners which you find here. Okay, uh, neutrino physics uh, was another um, um, point which uh, stick out in the, the strategy and the strategy here uh, uh, recommends that Europe and CERN should continue to support long baseline experiments in uh, Japan and in the uh, US. Going back a bit in history, again following the 2013 strategy update, 
since then, CERN operates the so-called neutrino platform to do exactly that, to support in particular European researchers, but also others, to participate in long baseline neutrino experiments. As the most uh, prominent example, uh, it, uh, there are uh, two um, uh, cryostats for the development of liquid, liquid argon TPCs uh, for Dune, the so-called proto-Dune experiments. These two cryostats are uh, one to 20 uh, scale of the, the real cryostats and at the end. And they uh, develop uh, two technologies, the single, so-called single phase liquid argon TPC and the dual phase, which, and this is the development also over the last year, uh, will uh, make a space for a new concept, uh, and the so-called vertical drift uh, concept. That what we will do and then have started to do at CERN is to strengthen this effort, uh, to strengthen the neutrino platform. And we also will provide as a contribution, a European contribution to the uh, LBNF Dune infrastructure, a second uh, of the final uh, cryostats. I just want to mention that it's not only Dune, but the Neutrino platform also supports several projects which are uh, relevant for T2K and the Hyper-K project uh, in Japan. Now, coming back to the big cryostat, it's there really big. You are down thing. to five minutes. Sorry. Yeah, I will, yeah, no, I will, I will be fine, Alina. So these are really big, uh, big objects, 66 times 20 times 20 meter about, uh, which are based on the technology which is used for ships on liquid, uh, natural, uh, liquefied natural, natural gas. And uh, what we are doing now is uh, we have prepared everything and we do a technical uh, review uh, these days and hope that we will be able, if this is the outcome is positive, then to start procurement uh, and uh, it is this year. Okay, here is a, a look into the very recent results from the Neutrino uh, platform is uh, uh, the test of the almost final uh, readout PCB anode for the Dune liquid argon TPC. Okay, um, the last point I want to mention is scientific diversity, uh, which is also uh, identified as an important uh, element in the European particle physics strategy. I remind you here on the right hand side on the CERN accelerator uh, complex with the various areas from uh, Nucino platform here and then the end of uh, Elena AD, Elena, which is uh, uh, upgraded now uh, to the anti proton, anti hydrogen experiments, Isolde and the PS here. And this is uh, the schedule for the uh, experiments for this year. And you see that uh, in the summer, uh, this uh, diversity program will start again. Also worth to mention is that the physics beyond collider study, which was initiated a few years ago, will uh, continue. Now, our strategy did not only touch on uh, scientific issues, but there are, of course, also other important issues. And I do not want to give you the impression that they were neglected and they will not be neglected, of course, in future. Uh, I mentioned the essential role of theory, which was acknowledged, the support for computing and software infrastructure needed for the experiment. Also, the exploitation of synergies with neighboring fields, in particular nuclear and astroparticle physics. Uh, the environmental impact of particle physics should be mit, minimized in future, and we should be very sensitive to this. Investment into the next generation of researchers is uh, an important issue. Knowledge and technology transfer as well. And of course, public engagement, education and communication. And Alina, that brings me already to the summary. So the steps, some steps to implement the strategy are, are taken at CERN and elsewhere. Um, some key objectives for the next updates to be achieved by the next updates in around 2026 
is of course the successful operation of the LHC and uh, the experiment, the construction of the Hyalomia LHC and the big uh, phase two upgrades of Atlas and CMS. It started the installation of the first dune detector, completion of the FCC feasibility study and accelerator R&D on high field magnets, plasma weight field, muon collider. And to end, I cite uh, Fabiola, who said at some point that the 2020 update of the European strategy is visionary and ambitious, but also realistic and prudent. It lays the foundation for a bright future for particle physics in Europe within the global context of the field. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joachim, and uh, in particular for the updates. Uh, are there any questions for Joachim? Yes, uh, thanks for a nice resume. I, I didn't see any mention of LHEC, which instead was mentioned in the previous talk. Yep. So is this a project under study or uh, under consideration in some way or, or not? I mean, I, I think it's fair to say that uh, the uh, LHEC uh, did not stick as a, as a very, very high priority uh, project in the European uh, strategy. So uh, for this reason, we are certain, uh, at the moment concentrating on the issues that I just said, on the LHC, on the FCC study, on other things like neutrinos, et cetera, PP. That doesn't mean that uh, uh, is at the time of the next strategy update, yeah, when the results of all the feasibility studies and the, the roadmaps, et cetera, will be on the table, LHEC uh, will, will not be rediscussed, certainly. And uh, one thing uh, I mentioned is that as part of the accelerator roadmap, the energy recovery lineup is a high priority item which of course is uh, strongly related to LHEC and FCEH, FCCEH, right? Okay. Saleh Sultanov, please. Hello, everybody. Uh, actually, I have comment for both Joachim and Timothy presentations. Uh, I should emphasize, emphasize that uh, energy recovery unit with 50 GV energy should not be considered not as sole, not as a baseline option for the FCC. We should take in, uh, keep in mind possible energy frontier options, namely something like ILC or muon ring for this case. Uh, I hope that you will uh, take this into account in European strategy. Okay, thank you. Abed? Yeah, thank you. Um, so you mentioned uh, this neutrino platform, which I think was very useful worldwide for the neutrino experiments, which are not necessarily located at CERN. And you also mentioned possible discussions with collaborations with on EIC with the US. So it yep. forms a question whether such a model could be envisioned in the future for EIC and what is it that uh, user, the European users of EIC or interested people could do, um, what would you advise? I'm not sure if I understood you, your, your question. You are thinking of something like an EIC platform at, uh, at CERN. Yeah, that, that's, the, that's the obvious parallel. Yeah. Uh, it, it could, you know, that's that. So that's what I wanted to see, how that neutrino platform came about and what could be done in that direction. I think the neutrino platform came uh, about because as a result of the 2013 update of the strategy it was essentially decided that Europe, that CERN, will not copy uh, the efforts in the US and in Japan uh, on long baseline neutrino experiment. Um, how we will organize or how Europe will organize the contribution to EIC, European contribution, that's, an, that's another thing. That's, I think, something 
they were in particular the nuclear physics community in in uh, Europe is in the driver's seat to define that. But we at CERN, of course, will be open to discuss uh, uh, how we can uh, support efforts here. Yeah. If at the end it's uh, EIC platform at CERN or not, that uh, is prob probably a bit early to, to, Thank you. to decide. Okay. Thank you very much, Joachim. I think we need to move on. That was very interesting. Uh, and uh, we go to our uh, last speaker of this session, Tim Holman, and uh, we'll see when we get the EIC running. Thank you. Tim, will you share your, uh, your slides? Yes, thank you very much. Just one minute. Can you see them okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. So uh, thank you very much uh, for um, this very nice invitation to speak to uh, DIS 2021 and uh, provide some perspectives on the electron ion collider. Uh, <clears throat> from a high level view, the, uh, the EIC is a DOE project to build one of the most advanced particle colliders of its kind in the world. Uh, and the physics driven requirements mean that uh, its capabilities will be state of the art. Um, when it's completed, it will be the only collider in the United States. And in addition to some very important science, which I'll talk about in a moment, it will also serve as a primary focus for frontier acceler accelerator physics R&D uh, for quite some time. <clears throat> a primary science goal is to understand how the properties of the nucleon are dynamically generated by the quark and gluon fields, including, uh, colloquially speaking, how mass is produced from energy in the interior of the proton. Uh, it will be sited at Brookhaven National Laboratory, uh, implemented by Brookhaven in partnership with Thomas Jefferson National Accelerator Facility. Uh, we've had a number of countries, as uh, well as CERN, as you've just heard a moment ago, expressed interest in various aspects, uh, and uh, we're looking forward to, to those collaborations and participations. And um, I'll say more in a moment about its status, but it's well along in its initial stage in terms of the DOE process for uh, critical decisions. Of course, uh, the case for the electron ion collider did not arise uh, just yesterday. And so one can look all the way back to the long range plan in 2002 and begin to uh, see that the community recognized the need uh, for a, a machine capable of understanding how the quark and gluon fields dynamically generate uh, the properties of the nucleon. Even uh, back in 2002, for example, there were words like, in it, it'll be an accent, essential accelerator and detector R&D should be very, given very high priority in the short term. So that was quite some time ago. Most recently, uh, there was a National Academy study in the United States. And um, I'll say more about that in a moment. Um, within the nuclear physics program in the US, uh, we, uh, get our marching orders from the community, so to speak, via what's called the long range plan process. The most recent one of those was in 2015. And here you see the top uh, four recommendations. And you'll note the third one, of course, was to construct a high energy, high luminosity, polarized electron ion collider as the highest priority for new construction following the completion of EFRIB. I'll come back to that and, and also I'll come back just in a comment to number two as well. So as I mentioned, um, in one of the things that's very important in sort of the process of uh, teeing up a major facility like this in the United States is getting an independent assessment um, by uh, the National Academy of Science. And so 
uh, we did that. Um, and it concluded that an EIC can uniquely address three profound questions about nucleons and how they're assembled to form the nuclei of atoms, how the mass of the nucleon arises. Of course, a very interesting topic. The nucleon is about a gev, but the quarks inside it are a few tens of MeV. Somehow uh, the mass of the nucleon is generated by the interaction of those quarks and gluons. But how that happens uh, is yet to be un understood. Um, how the spin of the nucleon arises, and also, very importantly, what the emergent properties are of dense systems of gluons. Because when you get to very small Bjork X, the system is strongly dominated by gluons. Um, but in addition to the science uh, thrusts that were called out by the National Academy, they also recognized that it would be a unique facility uh, for leadership in accelerator science and the technology of colliders. And so that is not a minimal consideration, uh, it's sort of uh, very important in addition to the science, because as we all know, accelerators are becoming ever more important in very many aspects of science and technology and even uh, national needs. So uh, the EIC in the United States uh, has been moving out smartly uh, in 2020, fiscal year 2020. Uh, it had both critical decision zero, which I'll explain in a moment. Uh, it had uh, a project start. It had a site selection, and it also had a dedication. And so uh, the pictures you're seeing with the two senators from uh, New York and Virginia, respectively, uh, was at the dedication of the EIC. And one of the features, which is very important, is that um, the EIC will be implemented by a partnership between Brookhaven Lab and Jefferson Lab, and therefore the show of support from both uh, Senate delegations in the United States is very important and very much appreciated. Um, the estimated cost is between uh, 1.7 and $2.8 billion. Uh, that may not be all new money, so to speak, because over the course of the construction, some redirection of funds and effort from the RIC base uh, may be possible. The machine will use the, the RIC assets uh, and two interaction regions. Uh, we'll have two interaction regions with one of the interaction regions outfitted outfit, with a major detector. Uh, it is um, fully capable of a second interaction and a second uh, detector, but within the baseline scope, uh, one detector is included. And um, the project receives critical decision zero is now very far along towards critical decision one in DOE parlance. Um, and we expect that uh, probably this month in 2021. Um, we really intend for the EIC to be a game-changing resource for the international nuclear physics community. We, we want this to be a facility for the world, not just for the United States. And we really look forward to engaging with the international community and international funding agencies about potential collaborations and contributions to the EIC. And uh, that is very actively being pursued. Um, the EIC um, has very demanding uh, physics-driven requirements. Uh, it requires a high luminosity, 10 to the 33 to 10 to the 34. Um, very highly polarized beams, 70%. Uh, a large center of mass energy range uh, from uh, 20 uh, up to 140 GeV. A very uh, large range of ion species from protons to uranium. Of course, it needs a large detector acceptance and good background conditions. And um, as I mentioned a moment ago, um, the, the, it's being built in a way that accommodates a second interaction region, a second detector. Um, all of these uh, design parameters uh, either meet or exceed what was identified by the Nuclear Science Advisory Committee in its long range plan, as well as the EIC white paper requirements that were endured endorsed by the National Academy of Science. Um, and as already stated, these goal, these uh, requirements uh, point to a machine that is, that is really state of the art. And that's 
uh, both a challenge and one of the excitements for those people who uh, are accelerator scientists who uh, like to be challenged by something new and difficult. Um, just a quick word about uh, DOE uh, parlance, if you will. I've been talking about CD0 and CD1, CD2. These are gates through which a large project like the EIC must pass. Um, and uh, we've passed CD0, which is approved mission need. Um, <clears throat> we are about to pass CD1, which is approved alternative selection and cost range. That means uh, you've, you've looked at the design well enough to home in on the design and you know what you want to build. Uh, once you're past that gate, then you go to CD2, which is to approve the cost and schedule baseline. And from there, you're sort of off uh, and, and so-called cutting metal and, and building things until you are finished at CD4. Um, this is a very large project. Um, and for projects that are above $750 million in the DOE system, uh, they require approvals at higher levels. And so at each stage for this project, uh, approval will be determined by what's called an Energy System Acquisition Advisory Board, or ESOB. <clears throat> and um, even for those, there's a pre-step, which is a meeting of what's called the Project Management Risk Committee. So uh, the level at which the approvals come is very high. Uh, you certainly don't want to make any mistakes coming up to those things. So as you can imagine, a great deal of, great deal of care is taken uh, in the preparation for each of these stages. Um, this is a chronology of what's been accomplished to date. Um, I don't think I need to go through all the separate items. Um, you could see the critical decision zero on December 19th the anticipated CD1 approval, which is April or May of this year. Um, what may impress you about this list is simply that you see a lot of items in between those two dates, CD0 and CD1, which is again, an indicator of the care taken in preparing for each of those important gateways through which the project has to pass. Um, I won't go through this slide because it basically emphasizes what I just said. Um, looking forward beyond critical decision one, <clears throat> we expect um, accelerator and technical reviews in the spring and summer of this year. A call for detector proposals has already gone out. Um, we will start preliminary design this month. Um, we expect for detector proposals to be submitted by December of this year and for there be a selection of a project detector in March of next year. Uh, we will start doing what's called earned value tracking, which is sort of tracking how much uh, value you, uh, you how much um, how much of the project you've accomplished in a particular time period um, and how much value you have earned towards the completion of the project. Um, we will um, settle on in-kind deliverables with uh, agreements from others who may wish to contribute by the summer and fall of 2022. Uh, we look forward to CD2 approval in the first quarter of fiscal 23 and CD3 approval in the fourth quarter of, of 23. And so what all this should be uh, conveying is that uh, the, the uh, project is moving out very smartly and very efficiently and um, on a very um, timely track. One of the things that's been very important um, at all stages up to this point is the fact uh, that there's a very strong EIC user group already formed, even though you know the start of operations for data taking probably won't occur until a little bit after the next decade. <clears throat> and you see already there are uh, over 1,200 collaborators from 252 institutions in 34 countries. Um, this group has been extremely active in developing the yellow report for the detector. Uh, there are annual meetings which oscillate back before, 
between the United States, uh, Europe, and other countries. And you can see the list of where they've been. Uh, I would say that this, that the fact that this, there's been this strong interest uh, by this group has been very impressive uh, to upper DOE management uh, as evidence of uh, the compelling nature of the science to be accomplished. And I think uh, this group has been influential in a word in getting this project approved, helping to get this project approved and seeing it take off in such a, an efficient way. Um, as I mentioned, we are very uh, interested in promoting uh, collaboration and cooperation. We are having uh, bilateral meetings with potential partners uh, to discuss opportunities in the accelerator and experimental areas. Um, um, we are uh, actively seeking uh, in-kind contributions to accelerator design and hardware. Um, there's already been one workshop which was hosted by the Cockcroft Institute in the UK that back in October on promoting collaboration on the electron ion collider. Uh, we are also very interested in similar uh, collaboration and cooperation on the detector. Um, expressions of interest uh, in that were sub solicited and, submissive and submitted last November. And uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, call for proposals for detectors was issued in uh, March last month. There are regular meetings among the international funding agencies that are organized by my office. Office of Nuclear Physics. These are information exchange meetings, and we're actively pursuing um, putting agreements in place, uh, at least general agreements uh, that form umbrella, umbrellas, umbrella agreements under which <clears throat> more detailed uh, collaboration can be documented. Um, <clears throat> one thing to note is that uh, New York State in the United States is a uh, partner in the EIC infrastructure uh, construction and has committed to, uh, to um, contributing $100 million in in-kind contribution. So um, I won't uh, try to go through this chart in detail, um, and, uh, but it'll be in the slides if, if you want to look afterwards. The one thing that I would point out about this, this is a uh, sort of high level uh, org chart of the organization for the EIC project. And the one thing I'll note, if you look in that middle box, is that you will see um, um, people both from, from Brookhaven, for example, Jim Yeck and Ferdinand Willicke. You will also see people from Jefferson Lab, Allison Mung, Andre Sergi, Rolf Ent and uh, Elke Aschenauer from BNL. And it underscores the point once again that this uh, project is being implemented as a full intellectual partnership in both the construction and the research program between Brookhaven National Laboratory and Thomas Jefferson National Accelerator Laboratory. And that is something of a unique occurrence in, in uh, the, the Department of Energy Office of Science. Uh, so it's a bit of an experiment. It's going very well. Uh, we expect it to continue to go very well. Um, uh, there'll be a test on this after the talk. Um, of course, you can't read any of those boxes, so I'm being, uh, I'm being facetious. But uh, again, it's just to demonstrate that the project is um, well on its way to being uh, fully organized and uh, once we get uh, names and responsibilities in all those boxes, you will see a mix of people, again, from Brookhaven and Jefferson Land. And you see the major WBS elements along the top uh, for the different systems. So again, the project is moving very well. Um, Brookhaven and Jefferson Lab have signed a partnering agreement in last May. Um, there is an executive management team established that integrates Brookhaven and Jefferson Lab into the project leadership roles. Uh, there is an EIC council chaired by the Brookhaven director with also uh, with the Jefferson Lab director who's a founding member and major international partners will join the council. Um, and we hope that will be quite a number of, of international partners. Um, we have established standing advisory committees with international membership 
including a machine advisory committee, a project advisory committee, and a detector advisory committee. Uh, we know these kinds of projects are very challenging and uh, certainly understand we need to take full advantage of the international intellectual capital of people who have uh, built such machines and have a great deal of experience so that we uh, can do this successfully with, with everyone's help. This uh, gives you a uh, sort of thumbnail of the uh, re so-called reference schedule. So this is not a baseline schedule, but this is what people think about uh, when they think about how they would like the project to go on a technically driven uh, schedule. Uh, you can see the various gateways at the top for CD1, CD2, 3, and then CD4, uh, somewhere in the vicinity of uh, 2031 to 2033. Um, I won't try to go through all the different elements, um, but uh, this is the critical path. Um, again, uh, things are uh, on schedule to this point. Um, if uh, we are concerned about anything, of course, we're always concerned about affordability. Uh, this is a very large project for the DOE Office of Nuclear Physics and the Office of Science. Um, it will require a reprioritization of RIC operations funding. Um, once RIC becomes closer to uh, completing its, its currently uh, under uh, current projects underway, S Phoenix. Um, and there will be a significant ramp up of project funding required to maintain the timeline for the DOE critical decisions. So of course, you need a funding profile that matches the schedule that I just showed. And um, that's something that has yet to be baseline. Um, of course, it uh, I think goes without saying that the most cost effective projects always follow as closely as possible to a technically driven schedule. So that will be uh, the goal. Um, with respect to partner engagement, um, international engagement is highly desirable and widely expected. In-kind contributions to the accelerator and detector are being pursued. And uh, this, is a, this is the moment when partners should consider uh, engaging on the EIC, particularly as concerns the machine, because uh, as people who built these things know, uh, the machine typically moves out on a schedule that's somewhat faster than the detector. Uh, you, you really get the machine uh, thoroughly underway sooner. So for uh, collaborators who wish to engage uh, in particular on the machine, now is the moment to contact us. And uh, even if it's only to put in a high level agreement about collaboration so that uh, if you decide to, con to collaborate later, the agreement is already in place and there's no delay. Um, so that's uh, sort of just a small advice. Um, I did want to mention, I know my topic is the EIC, but I, I do want to mention two other uh, items potentially of interest for this particular uh, audience. <clears throat> uh, one is the Mahler experiment at Jefferson Lab, uh, which is now underway. Uh, Mahler will look for um, anomalous par uh, sources of parity violation in electron-electron scattering. Of course, uh, the theory uh, of this is so well understood that uh, we know the amount of parity violation expected from interference in the, in the gamma and Z poles. Uh, if we see more parity violation uh, than what's expected, it's evidence uh, for new loops due to new particles so far unforeseen. Um, we fully expect this will be a bellwether experiment, and uh, it will be particularly exciting in light of the most recent uh, G minus two results, uh, which seem to hold up uh, that there's a real discrepancy between theory and experiment uh, with a significance that's, that's growing uh, ever larger. And so uh, this uh, project is underway, and I think this is an exciting prospect. This will be uh, built and, and uh, operated certainly before 2030, so it's a more near-term prospect. The other, um, I think, very interesting prospect is the solid experiment for which uh, we just conducted a science review. Um, we've um, received a preconceptual design that was submitted to our office in February of this year. 
um, it will have a very uh, broad program in, in, uh, in deep and elastic scattering, scattering, deeply virtual Compton scattering, um, JPSI production. Um, I would think this would be of interest and um, presuming that it's, uh, it's approved and constructed, uh, it will be operating on a time scale, not a disjoint uh, with the beginnings of the electron ion collider. And that could be very exciting because of the complementarity of the, of the Bjorkane X region it will explore. So it will be particularly uh, good in the high Bjorkane X region uh, where it can achieve very high luminosities the electron ion collider can then concentrate on the lower Bjorkane X, um, you know, where the gluon dominance uh, is evident. So the two together um, can actually accelerate the pace of discovery for topics in deep and elastic scattering. Uh, even though this um, detector is still very far from being on the floor, um, the Jefferson Lab Program Advisory Committee has already received and approved a very a sizable number of proposals to use it. And so this is showing you some of the approved uh, experiments in uh, parity violating deep inelastic scattering, uh, semi-inclusive deep inelastic scattering, um, JPSI production near threshold. And, <clears throat> and uh, here's some of the other uh, transverse single spin asymmetry measurements deep exclusive meson production, time-like Compton scattering, deeply virtual Compton scattering, doubly uh, or double deeply virtual Compton scattering. So it should be, I think, another uh, exciting prospect for this community uh, going forward. So uh, coming back to the EIC, I would say it's off to a good start and moving out smartly. Uh, the science is compelling and the opportunities for technical development in a number of uh, areas are quite exciting. Um, the EIC is actively pursuing international collaboration and partnership um, to enable intellectual contributions to the machine and the detector. The EIC is promoting possibilities for in-kind contributions. Um, international participation is expected to be reflected in the governance of the EIC as well. For example, on the council, on advisory committees, and collaborations. So, um, so that's an, an important topic, uh, which is you know in the process of being discussed, and we'd welcome you know uh, uh, views from from uh, groups that are outside the United States interested in that topic. The EIC is almost at CD one. Uh, we expect approval for that in April and May. And it will soon be preparing for CD2 uh, that we expect to be approved in about a year from now. And um, I think we need uh, further definition. We need to, um, in a word, nail down uh, what contributions people may want to know so that we can uh, incorporate that into the baseline uh, before CD2 so that we, um, we can know what um, people really want to do and include that in the baseline. And uh, I think that's the last slide and I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Tim, for this uh, forward outlooking presentation. Thank you. Uh, are there questions? Yes, Pavel Nadolski. Yes, uh, hi. Well, um, uh, first of all, I would like to use this opportunity to thank the DOE for the such a strong support of the EIC, which I believe will be a game-changing new machine in the United States. I wish to ask you about your perspective on the interaction between the nuclear and particle physics communities. And uh, as you know, this machine is interesting for both communities, although the physics questions are closely connected, yet they are viewed from a little bit different perspectives in the nuclear and the particle physics. And furthermore, we need to have adequate support for people working on the intersection, let's say, between the LHC physics and the EIC, both in terms of the encouragement, but also in terms of the financial support. So what, what, how do you see it within your office? Um, certainly within the Office of Nuclear Physics, I think we're open to collaboration on all fronts. So it's not just collaboration with international partners, but collaborate, it's actually expected, collaboration among all of the uh, DOE laboratories, um, including, you know, ones that are focused 
currently mainly on high energy and also uh, ones that are focused on nuclear physics. So I think we're very open to um, receiving proposals and, and you know, there's, we always are, of course, obligated to review those and, and do a peer review. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's open. Uh, it's, it'll be proposal driven. So for example, if people from the high energy physics community want to submit proposals in response to the call for detectors, I think that would be very welcome. But, but I also believe we need a similar um, degree of coordination on the theory side. If on the theory, theory side? Yes. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's uh, open as well. I mean, so we put out every year an annual uh, solicitation, which uh, has topics that, you know, we uh, respond to proposals on. And in nuclear theory, you know, of course, one of them is the electron ion collider. Um, if we receive a theory a proposal from uh, a group that's currently doing high energy, we'll certainly consider that on an equal footing with anything that comes from the nuclear physics community. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Now, uh, any other questions? No, it seems that uh, everything was clear. Thank you so much, Tim, then. Uh, Thank you. Abe, I guess you're taking over now? Yes. For the um, group so we are going to try to get a picture taken for the whole